Uh, so I just want to do a quick check here. How many people have seen the Spotify engineering culture video videos? Uh, can you raise your hand if you have not? Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to fill in the blanks for some things uh, because otherwise it might be confusing. Okay. Okay. Lock to chin. Okay. One of my favorite Toyota isms. Um, is this idea of no problem is a problem. And what that means is that we won't improve unless we are willing to explore what isn't working. Um, so not looking for problems is itself uh, a big problem. So for this talk, I'm not going to talk about what works at Spotify. Uh, there are videos and other people have written some stuff about this. Instead, I'm gonna talk about what doesn't quite work, what still doesn't quite work. Uh, for the purpose of showing like how how we might improve it might be interesting from your perspective as well So the, the first thing that still doesn't quite work is there is still too much distance Between problems and problem solvers. I'm gonna talk about what that means. So how many people have heard of the propinquity effect? I, I just put it up there. So you now you've heard of it um, the general idea is you will tend to form friendships and romantic relationships with people you spend a lot of time with, right? And this is not because you like them, it's because you are rationalizing why you are spending so much time with them is you obviously must like them. Okay, so it's, it's very wonky, but you know, that's how it plays out. Um, and conversely, if you don't spend a lot of time with people, it's more difficult for you to form a close relationship because again, you're trying to explain, hey, why don't I spend a lot of time with these people? I obviously don't like them, right? It doesn't make sense, but that's just sort of how your brain kind of processes things. So from a, this kind of effect ties in with agile type approaches. If you spend a lot of time with your customers, you tend to have good customer team relationships. If you don't, you tend not to have uh, good relationships. And this is just because of that effect. Um, I kind of described this. It's hard to have empathy when you are protected from contact. So um, there's sometimes a general idea in the industry of uh, getting managers or product owners, whatever, and they're protecting the team from the messiness of the context, messiness of the customer. Um, and I usually say, okay, that you might want to rethink that because what you're doing is you're preventing people from understanding and connecting uh, with that problem. And if you don't have empathy for the situation, for the people, it's very hard to build things that are good. Because one, you don't understand, and two, you don't care. So this, this kind of model, um, which I would say even, even formally when people look at agile things, they, they might uh, mistakenly go down this route where they think, okay, I'm gonna have a product owner, I'm gonna have designers, et cetera, and they're going to aggregate or help summarize what's going on so the team can focus on what they need to do. That tends to lead to this kind of low empathy, low engagement type team. Like they, they're, they have a lot of empathy for each other, they engage with each other, but they don't connect with the problem. Um, instead, you're looking for something more where um, these roles are more facilitating connection. So, uh, you may say, oh, okay, uh, the team might still need support uh, with understanding context and connecting with people, but um, that's what the role is for. It's not to gatekeep. So within Spotify, this is, this is something kind of like an older problem. It's still there where we have that. Sometimes there's a little too much gatekeeping. There's a lot of activity now to uh, deal with that. Uh, primarily things, what we call sound checks, which are effectively uh, user testing, so this happens very frequently, I mean, inviting teams to observe it. Um, so it's very difficult for you to be disconnected with the problem when you can see someone trying to deal with what you built and not being able to understand it, and you're behind one-way glass, so no matter how loud you scream, um, they won't <laughs> be able to work it out. Um, and, and that helps, so then people start going, oh, okay, now I get um, why we should build it this way, not that way. I get why our system is not good enough uh, because I've seen multiple people not be able to understand it. Um, the other thing from an internal perspective is um, customer meetings, so getting people, um, this is more for typically internal 
applications getting like you have a direct um, engagement with the people you're building stuff for. <coughs> okay, so I was saying like that type of problem, even though it's it's still there, it's it's getting better. Um, but if I zoom up a bit, so same type of problem, but I'm going to zoom up a bit. Um, at Spotify, when we say cross-functional, we're not talking about different skills within a team. We're talking more about the difference between uh, what we call R&D and what we call business. So R&D is effectively product delivery. Uh, it used to be called technology product design, but now we call it R&D because um, people like that better. Um, and there's distance between those two parts of the organization. If you, for people who've seen that Spotify engineering culture video, that was talking about product delivery as in R&D. It wasn't talking about the business per se. Um, the business, like the entire company used to be almost entirely R&D, so obviously like there's this kind of fundamental culture there, but uh, in the last while we've grown a lot in terms of business, pure business operation type thing, and you, you are seeing this kind of split uh, between the two. And what's the problem with that is effectively what I talked about before at a larger scale. So you have this, this distance hard to have empathy with the business operation side because traditionally um, traditionally, and by traditionally, I mean like a year or two, so it's not that <laughs> long, but um, traditionally, the, there's distance there. Um, and I would suspect the reason why we've been able to get away with that kind of uh, distance um, is because previously, uh, our product uh, was reflective of users with high intent and employees with high intent. So people who are really into music, uh, that was sort of the main thing you needed to worry about, and employees were really into music, so you could effectively rely on your own instincts to be pretty close to what you needed to understand, um, to identify with the group uh, that you're building for, and we can't get away with that anymore. Right, so I kind of, I haven't even listed all the different stakeholders that are involved now, but effectively we have a quite complicated multi-sided market, um, as well as business operations departments that are supporting that market, and they're all different. Um, and I can't rely on employees having high intent on it because for the most part, nobody, for example, um, uh, studies advertising as a hobby. They, they might, there, there actually is a guy I know who does, um, but he's kind of strange. Um, <laughs> most people, most people, they can't connect. So I can no longer rely on, oh, we don't need to uh, worry about distance because you like naturally are involved in this. Uh, now we have to say, okay, uh, I need to get people together because otherwise it's very unlikely that they'll understand uh, what they're building for whether or, or even care. Okay, so the question here, and this is actually one where I don't know necessarily what will fix this, um, but there, there's a question here of whether this structure, which we have currently with the R&D versus business, does that, does that work? Um, or do we need to think about something uh, different? Have we kind of moved to a different context here? Um, and there are, there are movements here, at least, uh, you know, temporarily for initiatives and potentially longer term to adjust this so that we can correct that distance. Uh, we do have time at the end for questions, but if you have anything that you want to ask in the meantime, especially for people who are not familiar with how we're structured and have watched the videos, et cetera, feel free to ping me and I can we'll either throw that box up or I'll repeat the question and we can cover that. Okay, so uh, distance was the first kind of major thing that still doesn't quite work. Um, the other one is there is still too much specialization. This is something I noticed and I'm, I'm not sure um, whether it is just a Spotify thing or a tech culture thing or a um, a US thing because I, I've noticed something very different because um, I used to work in Australia for a while and I didn't really have this effect as much potentially due to a lower population. But I noticed when I joined is that there was a lot of specialization as in people would say, I do front end stuff or I do back end, I do data, I do iOS, I do Android. We have this thing called full stack, uh, but that's somewhat rare. Um, so, and there, there's a lot of issues associated with that because then you'll hear things like, there's not enough front end work to do, or I have to plan things because otherwise the back end people don't have things to do, um, which I always found, I found very odd because typically um, in my background, um, you just did whatever was necessary to do. 
Um, it would just be like, what's the next problem? If you didn't have the skill, you just learn it. Um, and that was what um, we kind of expected. So this is kind of weird. Um, and and I, I thought like, what, what, is, what is causing this? Like what's, what's the dynamic here? Why does the specialization occur? At least one aspect um, I think is going on um, it is this kind of no interesting non-obvious dynamic that occurs when you pair a lot. So one kind of key thing um, is key person dependency goes away fairly quickly. Right, if you pair up, um, eventually, um, and I mean like very quickly, you no longer rely on one person knowing how to do something. Just because you kind of absorb very rapidly. Um, I, I, should, I should say if you're doing it well, like you, you could also just not pay attention and then you don't pick up anything. But generally if the kind of expectation, hey, you're working together and you're saying, okay, you have to rapidly pick this up because you're expected to do that, you, you notice that, oh, we no longer rely on any one person doing something because generally everyone can pick it up pretty fast, okay? Which means that you can do things with less people, right? If I don't require, in this example, A, B, C, D, and E, one person each to do something and the manager that is required to coordinate those people because now I have too many people, um, and so on and so forth. Um, if I can have less people who have lots of skills, then all of a sudden they can cover more things with less people and you see that kind of dynamic show up. So. I wonder, because effectively what we're seeing here is the thing which I have on the right here, like the things with the eyes. How many of you have heard of the idea of T-shaped people? Oh, wow, it's not that many. Can I get the hands of who don't know what I'm talking about when I say T-shaped? Ooh, okay. Okay, I'm going to do a bit of switch. Here's a bit of a lesson. Um, the eye-shaped means that you are specialized on one skill. So I have one skill that I'm very good at that looks like an eye. A T means that I'm good at one thing, but I also have breadth of knowledge across lots of other things. So it's kind of a generalist plus specialist. Uh, if I just had a, the top bar there, so a horizontal line, that would be a generalist. Now, traditionally in kind of agile circles, we talk about it important to be a generalizing specialist because you need the level of skill, so I need the specialist skill, so the depth of knowledge there, but I also want that crossbar because I need to collaborate. Right? I can't do it all myself, so having an ability to understand across multiple things allows me, one, to collaborate, and two, um, if you think about the type of work you do all the time, not everything requires specialist skill, so I have more people who have general skill. We can kind of move the work around. Um, it's easier to balance that out uh, without having a specialist for everything. Okay, does that make sense? Cool. So. Right now, effectively the problem I was talking about with specialists is too many I-shaped people, right? Which causes I have to, my teams explode up. It's, it's harder to uh, balance work planning even. Um, instead, uh, this is something I'm talking, I don't know how to do this, but effectively I want an, a different model. One where, because you still do need sometimes uh, specialists. There are some things we are working on where I kind of look at that and going, wow, it just takes, like you, you essentially need to get a PhD, um, so that's like a lot of time, and you think, okay, um, it's unlikely that you won't have this super specialization. They could still have some generalizing, but you're gonna have that thing for some things. But the vast majority of skills, I would prefer we go, okay, it's more like that full stack thing, which right now is not that common. Um, most of the people are T-shaped, and they have different growth paths. So one, I could increase the level of specialization I have as a T person. I could improve my abilities in the broader things, or I can sort of post up a few different specialties. So you kind of have the, the long T or the fat T or the, that's like a, like a X-wing fighter <laughs> thing. Um, and, and like having this, the majority of people falling into that bucket rather than um, the majority right now is on the right side. Okay, so I, um, we, this is actually, uh, yeah, this is very, I'm not gonna say this represents where we're going, it's more uh, what I'm talking to my uh, allies to work out how to do this, is to move from a model where we're not talking about front-end, back-end Android, iOS data, but more 
of general software engineer. So you're a general software engineer, you have specializations. Like do you know, like what kind of skill level do you have on different aspects? And this kind of, this can work for any, any new specialization we come up, we just say, hey, here's a new skill set that is valuable. But in essence, we expect people to, one, learn what they, they need to and learn what they want to, and then we kind of look at that, and that becomes the model. We stop talking about it um, as a front-end person. That's just more a skill you have. Okay, does that, does that make sense? I don't know how you're structured right now, so I don't even know how close this is uh, to what you're seeing. I see some more like the eye. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, th this is, if you, people watch the, the video, uh, we talk, I think uh, ne Henrik Nieberg talked about how we're not that good at large initiatives, and we're still not that good at large initiatives. Um, so, have people heard of Conquer and Divide? This is a little, little niche because this is like old school extreme programming concept, and it didn't really survive the agile marketing shift. Okay. So uh, first concept, everyone knows what divide and conquer is, yes? Right, so I have a bigger problem, I'm gonna split it up to smaller problems and then I can deal with each smaller problem and therefore um, that's a better way to approach it. Uh, in practice, like when building large systems, what you do is I divide um, and I build each part separately and then I run into integration hell at the end, right? So sound familiar? Been through this? Been through this a lot. Okay, so it's kinda like, Sure, yeah, I have to break down the problem, but splitting too early means like eventually I have to put it back together so that doesn't quite work. So, like, we actually have a phrase for what that's called, so it doesn't really work that well. Um, instead, uh, the idea, Ken Beck talked about this, is called conquer and divide. So instead of splitting up the problem first, what I'm gonna do is ha pick a smaller version of that problem and I'll have a smaller team, cross-functional team, on that problem and uh, we will try to conquer the problem, as in we will work out, well, we'll build it all together and kind of work out all the interfaces, all the peculiarities of it. So when we decide to divide, we're comfortable that we're not gonna have integration issues because we essentially we flush it out at a smaller scale. Okay, so that's why it's called conquer and divide. And this is effectively the extreme programming agile way of attacking a larger problem. Um, whether or not you believe that works, it depends on what you believe in, but uh, generally I would say this works significantly more effectively um, because you essentially go into, uh, I guess I'll call it, you go into the pain early, so then it's not so painful later. Um, that's probably why people don't like doing this because it is painful to start when you hit every problem right up front. Uh, but less painful than going to production and nothing working. Okay, so. Um, I find there is still a tendency for us to divide and conquer for our large cross-tribe initiatives. For people who don't know what a tribe is, it's Spotify, it is, it's like a department, uh, so like 30 to 150 people kind of thing. Um, I said cross-tribe here, I also mean like just any larger initiatives. We have some that are like cross-company type things. So anything that's super large, uh, we still have a tendency to try the divide and conquer approach. So work out, okay, you'll take this piece, you'll take that piece and then we just have a lot of integration um, issues later on. What's weirder here, what makes this more difficult is not the intellectual, so that, that thing I told you about Conquer Divide. Easy enough to understa understand. So did anyone not understand Conquer and Divide? So intellectually, okay? Easy enough, right? I, it's kind of, because you'd have to put your hand saying I'm, a I'm an idiot, but so no one's gonna do that. But, but like generally not that difficult to understand the issue is that can you do it, right? So um, I remember like we've done, I kind of fa helped facilitate retrospective for like three major large initiatives. This problem came up multiple times. We said, hey, why don't we do this instead? Like we'll do some kind of combined kickoff. We'll do some kind of combined thing. That should flesh out the problems. We won't see this again. Did that like multiple times. We still do it. So, um, which means that this is no longer the problem like the the concept, the idea of conquer and divide and, and that kind of early pain is not the problem. It's how to cross this knowing doing gap. 
right? So when you know what the correct thing to do and people still don't do it, how do you deal with that problem? Um, and my answer is I don't know yet. Um, but hey, that's what this talk is about. Okay. Well, I do have I do have ideas for that. Probably look at because now you start thinking if it's not that people don't understand, then it is how to make it easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. Um, which is now looking at uh, perhaps tooling structure policy something um, that will interfere. So you're not thinking about it anymore. It's just more hey, um, it's just I'll, it's just easier to do this thing. I'm kind of have to work out what that is. Okay, next problem. Uh, there is not enough cross-pollination of ways of working. So uh, I kind of split into two forms of variation. Uh, variation that is useful and variation that is not useful. So um, at Spotify, we value autonomy a lot. You get to, in your area, you, it's we're kind of expected uh, to, you have, or even I would say obligated to work out what works best for you in your scenario. Um, and that leads or at least the target is that leads to useful variation, as in um, you are designing things that, are, that respond to context-specific forces, you're experimenting with different ways of doing things, and you're reinforcing that sense of uh, self-direction, autonomy, uh, responsibility. Um, Non-useful variation is when it's different for no particular reason, and you, that causes trouble. Right? Uh, if I want to introduce a new person to that area, I have to onboard them because the way of working is completely different and there's no, no, no real logic to that. Right? So I can't look at, oh, I would have designed it that way given local forces, so I understand why we're doing that way. It's just like, it's different here because you just so happen to have chosen a different way of doing something. Um, and that's just confusing, which may, so makes onboarding more complicated. It also makes it more difficult for you to move between areas. Right? So, uh, it's nice that, hey, everyone's doing their own thing. They have this uh, unity in their area, but it also then creates uh, problems to cross that boundary because now the things are different. So there's always this trade-off uh, that is happening there. Okay, so a kind of, this is a very simple feedback loop system diagram. If you have inconsistent ways of working, it's more difficult for people to move. If it's more difficult for people to move, it's more likely you have inconsistent ways of working and it'll just reinforce until all of a sudden you're not really working for the same company anymore. You're working for these kind of weird subcultures um, in, a, in a company, okay? So is, are people familiar with uh, aligned autonomy? Oh, only one? I thought you said you watched the video. It was the second one, I think. Okay, uh, autonomy. So uh, there's kind of a, uh, I'll say one thing. So autonomy does not mean you get to do whatever you feel like doing. That's a very shallow way of thinking about it. Um, probably will lead to depression. Um, autonomy means you feel like you are able to use all your, freely use all your abilities to achieve some kind of grand, more collective outcome, something like that. That's more likely for you to be psychologically healthy, strong, et cetera. Um, the other way doesn't work. Right now, in order for you to be able to feel that freedom, I'm acting freely, I'm using all my abilities, one, you need to know what you're trying to move toward, right? So if there's no clarity of mission, um, you're just confused or like you're stopped, you don't know what to do. Um, and that doesn't help. So mission clarity is an, an important thing. This is why we talk about aligned autonomy, um, meaning that we're all aligning for some common outcome, that's about mission clarity. The other aspect, but like that's not enough, that's not enough. The other aspect is you actually have to know what you're doing. So just because uh, we know, understand the collective goal doesn't mean we actually have the skills required to do it. And then we can try all we want, but we will fail. And again, we don't feel like we are contributing towards something because we just don't know what to do, um, even though we know what we're trying to accomplish. Does that make sense? Okay, so two pillars there. Um, there's a book called uh, Turn the Ship Around by L. David Marquette, um, which is quite good. Uh, also, he has like a YouTube video. Uh, on this, so that's good. Okay, so, and I'm kind of focused on the right-hand side, because I think we've gotten a lot better at uh, alignment, uh, but we don't emphasize the other, other pillar of competence enough. Uh, our autonomy c gets down to people tend to, like, we don't have like a standard, here's standard engineering practice per se, there is some, uh, but not as deep as I would like. 
Um, and there are certain habits, I would say, in the kind of agile space that are not easy to derive on your own. It took a long time for people to come up with this stuff. It's probably not useful for you to invent it yourself from scratch. Um, and these are the four that I would say as examples. Trying to derive test-driven development, like skilled test-driven development from scratch is difficult. Um, conquer and divide, given most of you didn't even know about it, um, difficult. Evolutionary architecture, how do I build something such that I don't have to build it all at once and that I can still evolve towards something that scales up? Um, you go, hey, oh, it's easy. I can just iterate this architecture. It's not that easy. You can sort of paint yourself in a hole if you're not careful. Um, and pair programming, working well together, two people, one thing, that's not a trivial habit uh, to derive. And effectively, we, we kind of expect that. Um, to some extent, we were okay when there were more old people. I mean old people, not as in legally protected old people, but um, <laughs> old people as in people who have been at Spotify for a long time um, versus people that are coming in. Um, in the past, there would be more experienced Spotify people versus new people. Our growth rate is so rapid recently um, that if you, like, and this is something we actually talk about, we step back and say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, what percentage of people have been here for over a year? And they'll be like, oh, that's like 10% of this, the, this group here. And we're going, okay, we can no longer rely on, oh, we'll just let them kind of do it. We'll just, we'll rely on tacit knowledge and people will just kind of pick it up. And you're going, wait a minute, when, it's more likely that the old people will pick up the habits of the new people than vice versa, right? Because we're just completely outnumbered. So um, you can no longer rely on norms and tacit knowledge when you are outnumbered. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my pickle metaphor here. Has anyone heard of Prescott's pickle principle? This is from Jerry Weinberg. No, because you're not consultants, so you won't know this. Okay, so um, if you could imagine, uh, there's a, two cucumbers talking to each other. One's like the grandpa cucumber, one's like the kid cucumber. Okay, and they're talking about this phenomenon where cucumbers go and they kind of visit this pickle jar. And all the cucumbers think, okay, you know what, I'm not going to be pickled by this pickle jar. I'm the toughest cucumber you ever knew. So I'm going to go in that pickle jar and I'm going to cucumber those pick pickles. And the young cucumber talks to the grandpa cucumber and says, so what happened to that cucumber? You know what happened, right? Nobody beats the brine, son. <laughs> yeah, so no matter what you try to do, yeah, that's a horrible, funny <laughs> story. That's they, he, Weinberg does it so you don't forget. Um, when you are outnumbered, you will be absorbed by that culture. And that's like, you warn consultants of that, because when they go in there, all of a sudden they're not consulting anymore. They're just parroting what you say, because they no longer can think differently. Um, and effectively, when in the, in the early days, we were able to pickle new people, right? They'd show up, whatever they happened to do before, we'll absorb them into the culture, no problem. We've got them pickled. We're now outnumbered by the cucumbers. Um, so you have to be, you have to think about differently. Maybe you have to do something more. I have to... Uh, be more explicit about norms, be more explicit about introducing uh, things to people in order to deal with that. Okay? Um, again, that's an ongoing thing because I'm not quite sure how to deal with that yet. Um, and we're, this is sort of like an active problem. Okay, so um, another one. There is no real mechanism to deal with larger organizational architecture issues. What I mean by organizational architecture is what I will call socio-technical architecture problems, as in what is, from a larger level, um, how do the technical systems interact with each other, like at the level of, okay, they're across tribe, across missions, like much larger scale, as well as the implication because of Conway's law. How many people know Conway's law? Not enough, okay. Uh, generally, um, the structure of your technical architecture will reflect the structure of your organizational communication mechanisms. So the original one was if you have three teams working on a compiler, you will have a three-pass compiler, right? Because you will, it's kind of like you have to build to reflect your thing. So if you don't want your architecture to look at that, you need to modify the structure and vice versa, kind of reinforcing. So uh, when we look at this kind of larger architecture things, we can't just talk about the technical things because of the human dynamics will affect what will be effective there. Um, etc. 
Okay, so the type of questions I'm talking about here is, if I want to do that thing I talked about, I want to try this thing with general software engineers with specializations, how would I even set up that experiment? What is the mechanism to do that? That is a beyond a single department or a single tribe in our case. It's beyond even a, a single mission, which is a kind of like our divisions. Right? What, what is the form for that? There isn't anything designed for that because we were designed to be, hey, you're autonomous in this area, different extent, but now this is a kind of a cross cross-cutting concern. Um, yeah, this is sort of like, uh, how do you set up logging? Because it's cross-cutting, um, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, how might we propose an alternate structure for how squads are typically set up? If I want to have that question quite complicated, again, like where does that even go? How would we establish more consistent, effective practice with larger cross-tribe initiatives? How would I deal with that problem where people aren't kind of doing the conquer and divide thing with large programs? I don't affect, there's really no formula I could like, the large program could come from any area. How would we affect that? Um, where could we discuss cross-platform, cross-tribe technical architecture patterns and improvements? If there is a better way to build something but at a larger scale, how would you do that? Like currently, um, our product still, it, it is a reflection of how our organization structure. What if we kind of look at the technology and saying, wait a minute, this doesn't really work. We probably want to build it differently and therefore in, the implication is we might want to structure ourselves differently. How do you even have that discussion? Okay, like right now it is somewhat ad hoc. You so happen to know someone and you kind of do this informal thing. This becomes more and more difficult the larger we are. Right, and I, I'm loath to suggest some kind of enterprise architecture group. Um, but something like this. So is there something where, like we talk about guilds. Uh, I don't know who, who's heard of, like we talk about guilds. It's effectively our kind of community of practice, so more informal uh, people with similar interests getting together. And I, I wonder, not formally some kind of architecture group, but informally, people who are interested in problems at this scale. And I say interest because I don't think it is intellectually beyond anyone to think about this type of problem. It's just that you may not care and you're kind of focused on what my team is doing, what my area is doing, and you don't want to kind of get involved. So it's more who wants to get involved in this sort of thing and and how we might set this up. I'm gonna try, I'm planning to try something like this, at least in kind of my local mission, um, and then we'll see how that plays out. Um, and then we'll see if the pattern can be repeated. Okay, so to, to end, um, kind of introduce all these problems, some of which I don't even know how to solve. So it's kind of like, good luck if you have the same problem, because if you come up with a solution, I'd like to know about it. Um, but like, how should one think about all this, like talking about problems like this? In 2008, I did a lean study tour in Japan. Um, if you've never been to Japan and you're willing to pay the money, I guess, um, it's quite interesting um, because you're, you're not like a tourist. You're actually looking at different companies and seeing how they operate, uh, which is a very unique uh, way to visit a uh, country. Um, on the fourth day of this tour, we met Takeshi Kawabe, um, ex-Showa Manufacturing. If you've ever read the book Lean Thinking, he's mentioned in that book. Um, so a uh, student of Taichi Ono. So we called a lesson from Taichi Ono that I liked. <coughs> this is after Taichi Ono was threatening to fire him and all this kind of stuff, uh, but then he kind of shaped up. Um, so what was happening at Showa is they were saying, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna learn how to do this is we will hire all these ex-Toyota people and then we'll just do whatever they tell us to do. And this is what Taichi Ono said, um, saying like, you don't get it. Um, you can't just copy and like hire it in. Um, you have to stop trying to borrow wisdom and you need to think for yourself, face your difficulties and think and think and think and solve your problems yourself. Suffering and difficulties provide opportunities to become better. Success is never giving up. So like there's this particular attitude that he was trying to help them understand um, that they wouldn't get if they just hired it in. Right, like even if they worked out, oh, this specific trick works, you don't understand the pattern. Even when you solve today's problem, tomorrow's problem will show up and maybe the people you hired in don't know how to solve it. But you don't have the right attitude. You haven't trained how to deal with problems. Like whether you want to get into suffering and all that, that's, that's more of a cultural thing. But still, it is hard sometimes. Sometimes it is hard. I wouldn't say it's easy. Uh, but you have to kind of get through it. And once you learn how to do that, uh, then you can keep getting better. So if there's anything fundamental to Spotify engineering culture, I would say it's probably autonomy. That's the thing that seems to, to hold 
uh, the strongest. It seems to be the thing that is most familiar uh, with people. Um, and, and if you go around with Spotify, I would say it holds quite well, right? So there are, there are some things like I mentioned before with the alignment and, and the capability, but generally everyone says, hey, we don't, we're into autonomy, and they try to make that happen. So autonomy means you are free to act, uh, but it also means like there's a degree of responsibility there. You're free to act, which means that you need to face your difficulties, and you think and think and think, and to solve the problems yourself. The fact that you do this is a sign of autonomy. If someone else solves the problem for you, that's not autonomous. That's you are just following what other people are doing. And so autonomy means you succeed by never giving up, that you work through all of this and believe that you can find a solution. So the question before I, I open up here is really what doesn't quite work at Churner and how are you trying to solve it? Thank you very much. Thank you.